I'm here with my friend Ashwin Agarwal. Uh, Ashwin, uh, there, there are at, at this meeting there is discussion about extended depth of focus lenses. These are lenses, okay? There are there's discussion about small aperture uh, lenses, right. um, a, a, and I emphasize that be, because there are patients who would benefit from technology in which they have an extended depth of focus, not for presbyopia correction. And you are bringing to the fore an idea that yields the, the same sort of benefit, but without any lens, without any implant. Right. What is this magic? Oh, well, I, I think, uh, first of all, thank you, Josh, for having me uh, in, the, in your studio. And uh, so the concept here was to actually try and use a different platform. And I know that when we talk about refractive correction of these patients, we usually talk about corneal-based uh, procedures such as an inlay, or we're talking about a lens-based procedure, procedure such as the IC8 for Mackie Focus, or uh, some of these platforms which are, honestly speaking, one, expensive to the patient and the uh, surgeon doing them, Number two, not accessible to a lot of countries around the world. And uh, honestly, they are going to see more and more uh, regulatory and other issues when you come to using products inside the eye uh, with uh, stuff like that happening. So what uh, their concept was to use the iris as a platform. The iris as a platform was always meant to do a shutter's job of a camera. And that is something that we want to bring back to the table. And if we understand the shutter, the minute you shut the shutter size to an apt or an optimal level, you're actually able to get a clear quality picture from uh, any camera. Using that concept, if you, use a, if you reduce the pupil size using a pupiloplasty technique uh, of your choice, whichever pupiloplasty technique of your choice, but the concept is to reduce the size of the pupil to around 1.5 millimeters. And this is an average I'm taking. We have different occluders of 1.6, 1.5, 1.4 uh, occluders. And you base it based on what the patient is seeing best. Because there's 1.5 as an average. Why do I take 1.5 and not 1 is the question. Uh, sometimes asked to me and the reason why I think one does not work is because the amount of light going inside itself shuts down the clarity of vision is there so basically your patient be walking around like a, one single camera uh, one single candle in a room you can see things it's clear but it's dim yeah actually there, 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 there's another I mean humor me because I'm, I'm, an, I'm an optics geek if you start bringing the pupil size down more, also it's actually you actually lose clarity Absolutely. because th there there are diffraction, diffraction. yeah limitations Absolutely. and the and the optimal this is as you can guess uh, the 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 I hope I'm not disclosing anything that I shouldn't uh, but the the conversations of the group of authors of the the standard optics textbook of, of which I'm a member. Um, uh, one of the hotly debated topics was what is the optimal pupil size? Right. And yeah, I mean, you you can't get a lot smaller than than 1.5, yeah. uh, regardless of the amount of of photon loss. Absolutely. Uh, because of of the of, diffraction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it again goes back to diffraction. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I'm, I'm so happy you bring that up. You bring up more things. So, uh, so there is uh, also what happens if you drop the pupil size to 1.5 the concept of uh, vignetting. So basically it shuts down all the other stuff around and you're actually focusing on what you really want to see. That's really helping in, especially where do you use these cases? Where do you use these? This concept is actually used more in really high-end astigmatism. When you have cases such as RK, previously done RK procedures, when you have uh, procedures such as old LASIK flaps which you are not able to recorrect, uh, dark, you want to switch between from keratoconus, which are already stable, but now you, you decide whether you want to go dark or you want to go already 45. Can you do a clear lens extraction and do a pupiloplasty? That's a beautiful choice, and actually they've worked so well for us uh, in, in the recent past. Yeah, no, this is, this is wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, 
Yeah, that when when you already have a a, a highly a regularly multifocal cornea, uh, any conventional lens choice is is not going to, uh, you know, I mean, it's not going to suffice. Yeah, yes. it's not going to help. Um, so, um, what you're doing is you're creating. Uh, a, 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 in sort of the, the the current lingo that you know the cool kids use is is that the, the, this is an an extended depth of focus system, but you're not using it for presbyopia. You're using it to uh, deal with the fact that you have this sort of multifocal cornea, yes. and uh, the cornea itself has multiple um, multiple refractive powers, and you're creating a system in which your extended depth of focus incorporates all of these, these, these powers. And I'm so happy that you bring up radio keratotomy because that's a, a kind of a shifting target too. Yeah, there's one very important concept I think which uh, a lot of the surgeons and clinicians must understand is that of cord mu. The but cord tell me mu. About that. Yeah, so cord mu is basically the distance between the pupillary axis and the visual axis of that patient. And in usually when you see these patients, and you can pick this up on a pentacam, it's always available there. And uh, the minute you see it on a pentacam preoperatively in a patient which has a high astigmatism, you'll see that that distance is a little off. The minute you finish doing this procedure, you're actually bringing that cord mute down, uh, reducing the size of that, uh, the limit of that cord mute. The minute you do that, visual clarity is a directly proportional aspect to this. And this is something that we're starting to uh, see more and more, examine more and more. We're on the verge of measuring this for patient to patient. So each millimeter, what's the size and what's the cord mu that you should be able to attain at the end of it. And that's something that we're really strongly advocating uh, to visualize in your pentacams when you're seeing this. Or no, any, uh, it mean, any topography. For, uh, really, really interesting. How, how do you... Um, how do you center the, the pupil? And how do you personally center fabulous. the pupil? Okay, that's a fabulous question. So first up, uh, no, no, uh, no anesthesia, no this thing. You, you take the first Purkinje image. The first Purkinje image of the eye is where you center. Uh, that is the number one. There are four Purkinje. Yeah. You take the first Purkinje image, and that's the center point that you there, want to There are four if the, if the patient's to the fake egg. Correct. Yeah. So that's the point you want to hit uh, as soon as you uh, go for the, when you're trying to center it. Now, second, when you're on the table, so mark it before you go on the, slip, on the slit lamp, mark that. Now take it on the table because it can shift in and out when you're on the table. Now when you're on the table, we also have a pinhole marker which basically gives me that 1.5 outside. So mark around that on the cornea itself with the marker, how much you want to measure. You can also take that inside the eye, that same marker can be taken inside the eye to also measure at the end of the procedure to check whether you've actually got 1.5. Sometimes it's really difficult to know if it's 1.5 or 1.8 uh, in that measure. So some certain small tricks that we also are using is sometimes when you do pupilloplasty, you have to do a couple of them and it, you end up with a oval-shaped uh, uh, pupil. We do use cutter, uh, vitrectomy cutter at some points of time, sometimes, to just make that round edge completely round. Yeah, that, that, that's The small, that's a, finer that's a tip, point. tips which, uh, which yeah, uh, help. Yeah, No, no, that's great. So um, the, the eye is not innately optimized for a, a pupil that small, yes. and the photoreceptors themselves are oriented to have their maximal sensitivity across a, a larger pupil. I, I, yeah. is, is there anything, is there any yeah. adaptation at the level of, of the retina to, that goes on after a, a procedure like this? Uh, there is an effect called the Stills-Crawford effect. The Stills-Crawford effect states basically that at the level of the rods, not the cons, at the level of the rods, the perceptive light that it perceives is scattered all across, more so from the periphery of the rods. But when you come to the cones, the maximal acceptance comes basically from the center and nothing from the side. And this effect actually advocates, or let's say it supports what we're trying to do with pinhole pupiloplasty. And if you combine cord mu, you combine uh, vignetting, and you combine the still Crawford's effect, they all are supportive evidence that pin 
pinhole piploplasty actually works uh, and why it works. Some of the principal principles behind how it functions. And these are some of the uh, supportive evidence for uh, pinhole piploplasty. Yeah, function. this is really, really great, great stuff. And and like like a lot of things that are really smart. After the fact, they're really obvious, you know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but you thought of it. Um, Ashwin, the, the, this is really, really great. Uh, I uh, want to thank you for, for, for bringing, you know, something that seems simple and then demonstrating that it, it's, you know, it's really multifaceted and then again making it simple. Uh, that's, that's class. Uh, so, so anyway, thank you for, for, for bringing this, this to us. And as always, thank, thank you. you for being so very generous with your time with me today. Thank you so much, Josh. It's a, always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.